Okay, so a couple of things before we get started. Uh, if you have your handout, we're not starting at the beginning of this. You remember we ended last time right in the middle. So we're at the top of the, uh, the back side of the first page, the top of page two. And we just finished talking about the different ways that God's name is misused. And we were about to get to how's God's name honored. So we're at uh, number three there, how's God's name honored, uh, if you were following along in your handout. But before we get to that, we had a couple of really good questions last time. And uh, uh, one of the people who asked the questions is not here, Ali Lucas, but I'll answer it anyway. So she had a question about the Matthew 7 under number two there, uh, part six, the Matthew 7 under, uh, that should be hypocrisy is the blank there. Uh, using God's name in a hypocritical way. And she was wondering, you know, the, the context there is that uh, they're calling on the name of Jesus as Lord, and he says, surely I did not know you. So she said, how can that be? You know, how do you understand that? Well, if you look at the context of Matthew chapter 7 in general, he's speaking against false teachers. And so the assumption is in the example given that they are not using the Lord's name in faith. They're using his name as a means to an end to teach something that is not true. Okay. Um, and so that was the, the clarification there. Because there were some questions about how can they use his name as Lord? Um, and false teachers do that. Right? They, they use the name of Jesus in order to um, bring you in by his authority and then teach you something that he doesn't teach. So that's the reference there. The other question was around the numbering of the commandments. So there, uh, there are different numbers to the commandments depending on what uh, Christian denomination you're a part of and what tradition you follow. And so I was looking that up because I thought I knew the answer, but I wanted to clarify and make sure. Um, so one of the things I mentioned last time, which was corroborated by what I looked up, is that there are some traditions Christian traditions where the first two commandments are what we would call the first commandment divided. So they would say you shall have no other gods as commandment one, and then commandment two is you shall not make a graven image. So we interpret that as part of the first commandment having to do with not worshiping other gods. We would say idol, like the making of idols and the worship of those things falls under commandment one. So the numbering there uh, is changed sometimes. So you may, if you uh, grew up in one of those uh, denominational backgrounds, like if somebody references the fourth commandment, you might be thinking of the Sabbath commandment, and we're actually referring to you shall honor your father and mother. Okay. And then on the back end uh, of the Ten Commandments, let's say that you do that, um, that you have first and second commandment related to the worship of God. And that throws off all of your numbering. I guess for whatever reason, they wanted to keep it at 10. And so if they went that route, they combined commandments 9 and 10. Okay, so uh, because both of those have to do with coveting, they just put them all together. So really, the, the actual total content of those is all exactly the same. They've just had disagreements and differences on how to divide them up. Does that answer your question, Lisa? All right, good question. Um, so, uh, and I can I can go into more detail about that if you would wish to. You can you can contact me if you're really curious about some of the minutia of those decisions. But that's basically what it's about. All right. Hey, Pastor, real quick, yeah. just uh, what what was the line above six in number five? The Jeremiah 23, 12? Yes. Um, I, I had a copy that I filled these out on, and I did I brought the wrong one. So I have to look that one up. So let's just go ahead and turn to the Jeremiah 23, verse 12. What did you ever? False. false teaching, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So Jeremiah is the false teaching, and then Matthew 7 is, is hypocrisy or hypocritical. And perhaps the Jeremiah was 31 to 32. Yeah, I do. I remember that being a typo. Yeah. Because I, I remember when we looked that up, I was like, huh, 
I don't, uh, either I don't recall what I was thinking when I put that in there or that's the wrong one. <laughs> Any other questions about some of the stuff we ended with last time before we start? All right, very good. Okay, so let's turn to Psalm chapter 50, verse 15. Does somebody want to read that for us? Go ahead, Dave. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you will honor me. All right. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you will honor me. So how is God's name honored? Okay, prayer of supplication and praise. And what in this passage, what particular time of life is being highlighted? Trouble, right? <laughs> and when you're when your life is in trouble, when you're when you're having struggles, anxieties, and concerns, you honor God by calling upon his name. Right? He wants you to reach out to him in those times. Right? And that and that's very, very deeply connected to the first commandment, right? That he's our source of security, he's our source of well-being. And so when we're struggling, he wants us to reach out to him. All right, so then underneath three there, we have number one, note how we use God's name in the liturgy. What are some of the examples that come to mind? So what are some of, where are some of the places in our, in our liturgy, that are sort of the outline of our service, where we use God's name? Holy Communion. Where in Holy Communion? Okay, making reference to his body and blood. We don't usually use his name there, though. You what? In the creeds. In the creeds. Okay. Yeah. Huh? All three persons are mentioned in the creed. Yeah. Yeah. And when we get to the creed, you'll we'll see that the we divide Luther divided the creed into three articles: the first, second, and third. And each one of them has a different focus on a different person of the Trinity. Right? So they're making direct reference to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Confession. confession, right? Confession. What parts of confession? I think it, I think it's background noise. Did somebody answer online? Or did I miss? Okay. So one of them is said when I give the absolution, right? Because I don't say I, as Adam Thompson, most supreme human being and human being and perfect person of all time, forgive you of your sins. What do I say? In the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, right? Um, and so we're honoring His name there by. Pointing to him as the source of forgiveness. And right? so I'm just being used as a vessel of my office in that case. Also, the sign of the cross. Sign of the cross, yeah. So you may have, um, and I usually mention this just because there's sometimes like some anti Catholic stuff going on in, in some Lutheran congregations, and, and people associate the making of the sign of the cross with being Catholic. Uh, it's really just a personal piety practice. So if it's something that help, <clears throat> that helps you when the name of the triune God is given, um, do it. If it's something that doesn't help you or you don't care about and you don't do it, that's also totally fine. Um, so I just wanted to say that because sometimes I don't even think about doing that. I've just been doing it my whole life. And then in the context of being a pastor, some people think, oh, pastor's doing that. I'm, maybe I'm supposed to be doing that. That's, a, that's an Adam Thompson thing. That's not a Pastor Thompson thing. Uh, so if it's helpful for you, you should do it. The reason that I do it is it helps me remember my baptism. Okay. So where where do we first do that in the worship service? The entry. It, well, the very the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit at the beginning. Yeah, and we we call that the, the intro. It's actually another part of the liturgy. The invocation. The invocation. Very good. Right. And 
What do we mean by that? What what do you what does invocation mean? Invoking him or calling upon him. Yes, you're invoking the name of God. Right? We're calling upon him. So there's two reasons why we're doing that at the beginning of the service. One is we're acknowledging why we're gathered here. So worship him. And two, we're acknowledging why we can worship him the way we do, which is because we are baptized believers. So we're reciting the very same name into which we are baptized. And there's some really cool connections to that. That's one of the things that I do at funerals, at Christian funerals. When I know the person is baptized, we start the exact same way. And then I apply their specific name to that promise of baptism. Because right, that's a foundational piece of our comfort in the gospel of Jesus. Okay? And then um, I think of it as kind of a cool as a way of like framing the whole service. We also do this at the very end, and we do it with the blessing. Right? And the context of that blessing, if you don't know, you should write this scripture reference down. It's from Numbers chapter 6. And the context of that is that was a blessing given from God for the high priest of Israel, Aaron, to speak over the people of God and bless them by using his name. Okay, so it says specifically in there that it's the name of God that's being put on the people to bless them. So there's a lot of honoring of God's name in our worship service. And that's intentional and important. It's to work in line with this commandment, but also protect us from beginning to think that worship is about what we want to do, and about what we want to think about, and about what we want to say. Right? It's more about God and what he wants to say to us. So uh, you may have noticed today we added the responses back into the readings. And I, I wanted to do that not because it's a traditional verse contemporary thing, because it really isn't. It's more about Who's doing what in the service? And I think it's really important for us to recognize, most of us automatically recognize that communion is a gift from God, right? The gift of the body and blood. But the word is also a gift from God. It's him acting in our worship service. And so I like those responses because they uh, reflect that reality. Like even, and it's, it's funny sometimes I remember having thoughts sitting up there as a pastor, hearing the gospel reading or reading it, and then getting to the end of it, and it might be a particularly difficult passage, but what do we still say? Thanks be to God, right? And sometimes you're just sort of like, ah, I suppose it's thanks be to God, right? Because it's a difficult thing to hear. But that's an important posture for us to keep. Because it recognizes that it's not the pastor talking, it's not me talking, it's not the reader talking. This is God bringing his very word to me. Yeah. Adam, how was it as a PK when you would be hearing your dad say those things? <laughs> <laughs> the question was, how was it as a PK when I heard my dad hearing those things? Well, I, I'm ashamed to say that I didn't always listen very well as a PK. <laughs> um, but uh, I think when I was younger, I didn't fully understand them, um, even when they were explained to me. Uh, but they were definitely things that I refer to later on when I grew up. And, and like you have those moments where you, you hear something you've heard a bunch of times, but the Holy Spirit's working and you're, the circumstances of your life are just right. So that all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, I did not realize that that's what was going on the whole time I was doing this. Um, and so I love the parts of the liturgy that do that. And I think this is one of those where I'm, I'm in a posture of submission and attentiveness where I'm just a passive recipient of this gift of God. And it's really cool when you start connecting that to the history of the church as well. Um, all the way back to even when Paul was writing his letters, the Christian service we know was already primarily organized around two events, the reading of God's word distribution of the sacrament because those were the two really important things that god was doing in the worship service and then everything else is our response to that our response of praise and thanksgiving our response of joy or if though you know we've talked about already the, the difference between 
the working of the law and the working of the gospel. Sometimes our response is one of contrition and repentance. And sometimes it's one of praise and joy. And those all come from what God is first doing. So this is one of the things that I think I've had a lot of uh, opportunity to share with friends of mine from different Christian denominational backgrounds. That's quite unique in our in understanding Christian worship. Uh, because a lot of times the focus is on my experience in the worship service, which shouldn't be disregarded. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but my reactions and my perceptions are not the focal point of the worship service. The focal points of the worship service are the work and action of God. Right? So you shouldn't be coming here to see me or to hear me. You should be coming here to see and hear and touch and taste Jesus. That's why we're here. And so those sorts of responses and those postures are helpful in keeping that in mind. Um, so one example that I'll give, uh, and then we'll move on here, is uh, I have some friends who are at churches where they, they always do sermon series. So they're always doing a planned sermon series all year round. Uh, and I do not like that personally. So, and the reason I like that is primarily for your sake, uh, that it doesn't become the Adam Thompson show. So that we're not only talking about all the things that I think are important, that I think we should talk about, that I think people don't understand, right? Because what comes along with that is a sense of inflated self-importance, not only in, in myself, but also in thinking that I know what we ought to talk about as the church. And all of a sudden, it's no longer about God's word, it's about mine. So I don't mind doing sermon series occasionally for like Advent or Lent or even in the summer or something like that, especially if there are particularly poignant or relevant real life happenings going on that the church really should speak to. But that's one of the reasons I like following the calendar of the church here at the readings, is it's about what God is saying to us in the narrative of his word is the reason that we're here. Yeah. Plus, there should be a connection between the sermon and at least one of the three readings. Yes. Yeah, right. And so the comment was made that there's meant to be a connection between the sermon and one of the three readings, which is exactly right. Um, often it's the gospel, but it could be any of the three. And sometimes those are picked thematically. So you know, if you notice today that the Old Testament and the epistle were directly connected, the epistle referred to the events of the of Moses' face shining in the Old Testament, right? And then, of course, you have the two mountaintop experiences of the mountaintop at Sinai, where God is revealing his law, and then the mountaintop at Horeb, where through Jesus, God is revealing the gospel, that this is really my son. Listen to him. Listen to what he has to say. Um, so, the, the, and that's where I, I, I have a lot of passion for teaching about the worship service, because I think, for, at least for me, and I think other people as well, when you start putting some of those connections together, it's sort of like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that that was going on. I'd never noticed that before. And then all of a sudden it comes to life in a new way. So anyways, I'll get off my soapbox. Now. All right. Um, number four. So we did this with the first commandment. i give examples of the second commandments used as a curb, a mirror, and a guide. Remember, a curb is motivation of over fear of the natural consequences of breaking the law. Um, the mirror is a, that law is showing us our sin. And the guide is that we, uh, after Jesus comes into the picture, we now believe and operate that this is the best way to live. I don't know if this would be a, a curb or a guide, but have somebody... Um like a mentor or somebody responsible for you that when you say it, oh, okay. they correct you. Yeah, so that would probably be a, a guide, right? So a way this could be used as a guide is it's something that you're trying to avoid breaking. You can have a mentor or just somebody close to you who you ask, when I break this, please point it out to me, right? Because it's my desire to not do that. That's a good one. Uh, Pastor, um, yeah. My father, anytime he would use the Lord's name in vain, um, if he would say 
God, like whenever he hit his finger with a hammer or whatnot, he would always follow it up with bless us and save us because he would knew right away that what he did was wrong. Yeah. But at least he said, God bless us and save us. And, and, and to me, that, what, that, was, that was a curb. That was his conscience saying, hey, you just screwed up. Get back on track. Yeah, that's great. So um, that, that actually seems to me to be a mix of things, right? It's the curb <laughs> and the realization that, oh, my goodness, I have taken the Lord's name in vain. And then a guide that then says, so I'm going to use this in a way to actually glorify his name instead of uh, breaking this command, instead of misusing it. I like that one. I went through a phase where when somebody would, would say Jesus, but it would be in response to like stubbing their toe or seeing something crazy, I would just say, but oh, what has he got to do with it? <laughs> um, and because usually the, the point being that usually they're not thinking of like the person of Jesus when they say that, but according to the second commandment, that doesn't matter. Right? Um, you're using his name. Um, what about uh, the mirror? So this one, I think, is probably the one with the most examples is that, that when you realize that you've done what the second commandment tells you not to do. Or it's a mirror sometimes. This actually recently happened to me as I was dealing with something as a pastor, and, I, and the, the law was, was acting as a mirror to me, and I guess it would be in particular the second commandment, because I had, I've been thinking about this for hours, and I had forgotten to do one really important thing. I had prayed about it. I was, I was, I was being Peter. I was starting a building project on my own and trying to call the shots when I'm not the one who does that, right? Uh, and that's just a recipe for disaster because then I'm trying to fix things that I'm not equipped to fix. Anybody else have an example they want to share? Yes, Pastor. Yeah. So I guess I'm thinking uh, a, a little bit about the way Luther, uh, you know, does this explanation and think, okay, so if I, I take the positive side of this so if i'm using this as a guide i'm going to be honoring god's name i'm going to be giving him praise for his uh, holy name and you know kind of thinking in that light is so am i am i correct in saying that's the guide versus the curb yeah yeah the, the positive the positive reflection of the negative of the commandment so like okay the commandment saying not to misuse his name which implies that there's a proper way to do it. That is a guide. That's that's guide stuff. I mean, it doesn't mean that you can't do it even with the curb, but the curb's motivation isn't this is what I ought to do. It's I need to do this in order that that won't happen to me. Okay, good. That helps. Thanks. My mother used to say when somebody would say, oh, Jesus, she would say to the person, oh, you're talking about the man I love. Uh, I like that, yeah. yeah. And, and that's one of the reasons that I, I mentioned when we first started to talk about this commandment, if you remember, it's been a couple of weeks, is that there's also not just a sense of a negative usage, but also an empty one. Because I think most people, when they say stuff like that, they're not like thinking of Jesus, they're like, I hate that guy and I just want to drag his name through the mud, right? There is, there's just no connection in their mind to the use of his name and, and him at all, right? And so like your mom's way of dealing with that, Pete's dad, right? Those are bringing the personal aspect of, oh yeah, I'm using the name of God. I'm using the name of the son of God and I need to be cognizant of that. Um, so that's good, I like that might be funny to assemble a list of sayings that people use to avoid the empty use. Like cheese and crackers, right? You know. <laughs> yes. Well, I, you know, it's just sort of, we were talking about this, it reminds me of when you watch like edited for TV movies and sometimes the, the, the substitute word they put in is just hysterical because it's like not even close. Um, but yeah, I mean, that is a really good way to do things is be like, okay, I, I've noticed that I have this tendency to say this, to take the Lord's name in vain when, when I'm stressed or frustrated or I, I hit my thumb with a hammer or stuff my chart, whatever. Coming up with some creative things to say that you can still sort of express your frustration or your surprise, uh, but in a way that isn't incriminating you against the second commandment. So that's that's good. All right, any any other questions in general about the second commandment or anything we've covered or or 
maybe I've forgotten. All right, third commandment. So if you wanna to turn to page 74 in your catechism, if you brought those, that's where this is at, um, along with the explanation stuff. Uh, let's see. Um, Trish, you wanna read the third commandment and its meaning for us? Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. We should fear and love God so that we do not despise preaching and his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. All right. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. What's the Sabbath day? Do a quick explanation of that. Anybody want to venture onto that? <laughs> First day of the week, all right? It is now. Day of rest. Day of rest, day of rest day of right? Rest. So where does that begin? So where does the idea of a Sabbath day begin? Creation. Creation, right? Uh, in Genesis, we read that after all of the days and the work of creation that, that God had done on the seventh day, he rested and he made it holy, right? Um, then what is the, so where does it, what's the first iteration of observing that? Was it Sunday? Saturday. It's a Saturday, right? It's a Saturday. And uh, Friday, Friday down, Friday uh, sundown to Saturday sundown. Yes, Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. Because if you're looking at the way that the, the days are measured, so that gives you some insight into how it's three days from Good Friday to Sunday um, is the way that they counted days. So sundown to sunup is a day uh, rather than a hard 12 or 24 hours, um, the way we measure it now. Um, but yes, <clears throat> and what was that then transformed into, we know from when Jesus shows up and starts teaching about it. Huh? Oh, okay, yes. Okay, you're, you're, you're getting ahead of me. I meant more, um, what way was it taken incorrectly when Jesus shows up? The Sabbath. They were keeping the Sabbath, but in yeah. what way? Overkeeping. Over they were keeping. They were, they were over right? Uh, and if you really want to, if you want to get a good laugh at, at some point, just look up all the different rules for the Sabbath uh, in the time, uh, according to the Jews, the time that Jesus was alive. I mean, there's some really crazy ones. Certain numbers of steps you can walk. Um, you can't tie or untie knots. There are certain things you can't can't write. I mean, it's it's pretty wild stuff. Uh, but all of that. That conflict ends up being summed up by Jesus in one pretty poignant phrase, which is that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In other words, like you were not meant to serve the Sabbath. The Sabbath was meant to serve you, right? So, and so he would give examples of like which one of you, if you're a shepherd and your sheep falls into a well, is not going to go and get the sheep out. In other words, there are instances where action is demanded of you even on the sabbath and the sabbath is meant to be service to you so is it service to you to let your animal die because well it's the sabbath so i i've already taken my my 14 steps for the day and this is going to be work right um so that's the point that jesus was making so then for us it becomes sunday morning and what do we do on sunday morning go to church right what do we do when we get there Huh? Pray. We pray. What else do we do? Worship. We worship, right? But um, let me let me ask you this: Can worship become something not restful? Yeah. How? <laughs> you work night shifts, and you get off shortly before church. You come to church and out, <laughs> and you're just barely staying awake. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the point is, man, if you're working a night shift and you come. And you just get off work and you come to church, then it's uh, not necessarily wrestling. Hold on, I just want to know whether there was a camera on Bob Booth at the men's study yesterday. Uh oh. <laughs> Are you coming off a double or something, Bob? Yeah. He was coming off. He double. was totally engaged. Though. Yeah, no, he was. I was super impressed. Yeah. Wrong frame of mind. Wrong frame of mind. Wrong frame of mind, okay, right? So um, you can be here without really being here, right? When we try to make it a work instead of a joy. Yeah, okay. So when we try to make it a work, 
And what does it look like when we try to make worship a work? Um, so it kind of goes back a little bit to what I was saying before, is that when we try to move into the role of primary actor, so whenever, whenever I try to make worship about my action and my doing, and my, even if it's my prayer and my praise and my doing this and my doing that, then we turn worship into a work and it's not restful. Because there's a natural rhythm to worship and there's parts of it where you're supposed to do nothing but receive. You're supposed to, to hear. You're supposed to listen. You're supposed to eat. You're supposed to be available for the Holy Spirit to do his work, right? And so if there are, there are aspects of the service where I'm not supposed to do things. I'm supposed to be at rest and at peace, trusting in God and receiving that which he desires to give me, right? Whether it's his word or the sacraments. And so... Um, that's why Sabbath rest happens at church is because we're at rest with our Lord and he's at work, right? And he's doing the things that we can't do. Yeah. That's precisely why I don't participate in reading the Holy Spirit. The, uh, gospel. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, the, the practice here at Ascension is to read the gospel together uh, but Rob pointed out that's one of the reasons that he chooses not to do that is because he wants to just be hearing, just receiving, right? Um, and those those are those are uh, practices that go all the way back to the first century. Right? Uh, even before that, in the synagogues, right, we have uh, examples in the gospel readings where Jesus reads from the Old Testament scriptures, and those in attendance are just there listening. Uh, so that's been a practice for a long, long time. Pastor, also, um, I think it's a this is a good time to to be mindful of the definition of worship. We look at worship as a a organized set of things that we do on Sunday, but the word worship means to love and adore, and that's where our heart should be when we're in church to be to be loving and adoring, you know, our God. Yes, yes, I'm very good, and and that brings up. Um, I'll get you in just a second. Bro. Uh, that brings up something that's actually a really relevant question, especially in our time, which is, is anything unique happening on Sunday? Because well, I'll hear people say, well, I experience God most profoundly when I'm out in nature. Or I read the Bible regularly on my own um, and with my family, and, and we have our worship time with God. Um, is that is that worship when you're when you're out in the na in nature and praising God for His nature and being you know in the experience of that? Is it worship when you're reading the scriptures at home and and offering up your prayers uh, to God? It is. It is. So why why do you come on Sunday then? Okay, so there's a communal aspect of it, the gathering of the body of Christ, but you can do that elsewhere. And you can do that multiple times during the week. So is anything really unique happening on Sunday? Sacraments. Sacraments, okay. So why why do we do this? Why like if the you know these are such great gifts? Why do we have to do them in the context of church? Why don't we just do them wherever? So pastor? Huh? Show of unity, like we're all um okay, show of unity. No, sort of. Somebody was going to say something? Yeah, I, I was actually, this is Mark. I was going to just mention, I think you said a great word there. And he says, you know, the gifts from each other when we're together as a group. And so the building up of the body, the encouragement, uh, the sharing of concerns with each other, uh, it, you know, the reminder that our sins are forgiven and, and, and so forth. I mean, those are all blessings, I think, that we gather from a corporate worship. That's true. But I would argue that you can get many of those blessings just worshiping like in a family of five with two, with a husband and wife and their three kids, or even just a husband and wife. Oh, yeah. Agreed. Right? Yep. Um, and those are certainly blessings on Sunday morning. But what I'm sort of getting at is there's a lot, and this is a kind of a popular way of thinking in our culture, is, well, I'm, re I'm really spiritual, but I'm not religious. And when people say that, what they mean is, I don't like all the formality of religion. I don't, you know, 
I can I can love God and serve God without ever having to go to a church and be subject to rules and things that other people tell me are right and wrong and all this other stuff. Right? Now, how many of you have heard that before? Yeah, right. I I've heard that all the time. Um, so yeah, That's what you're getting at is it's law and cost. It's law and cost. You need to get constant reminder. Okay, so the, the reminder of law and gospel, but I think it goes even deeper than that. And, and there's a reason it's difficult to come up with an answer to this question, because we're usually thinking of this all in terms of, and if you think about all the answers you gave, are like reasons of faith terms. Like, well, so that we can be gathered together as the body of Christ. True. Uh, but this isn't the only place that it happens, right? Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am as well. Right? Um, the reading of his word, the gift he's given through his word, but I can also read that at home. And you can maybe make a practical argument like, well, yeah, but at church there's a guy who paid lots of money and went to school and read a lot of boring books that most people think are boring anyways, uh, so that he could be a sort of a quote unquote expert on, on certain aspects of the scriptures that are just helpful to me. That's a fair argument, but that still I don't think really answers the question of what unique is what is really unique about Sunday morning. Yeah. Okay. It gives me, um, it gives me a goal that I want to be there on Sunday morning. It sort of needs to, to remind it to me, and it needs to go in. Sure. It's kind of. Um, I heard somebody say this once, and I thought it was kind of cute. That when he left the church, he said to the pastor, "Well, my tank is filled again for another week." Yeah, yeah, so the, the personal right. focus, the refilling, the recharging right. from God. Yeah, okay, good, good. Um, so I'll give you guys a hint. And I, I previously didn't realize how fun it was to ask a difficult question and just sort of like watch people flounder. I had a professor that did that seminar and it always frustrated me. It's a little it's a little more fun on the other end, I must say. So I apologize for that. Uh, but uh, so um, what's the time frame that you're thinking of when I ask that question? Is there a natural time frame you're thinking of is the context of my life? And usually you're thinking in terms of decades, maybe. But what is Jesus planning for when he institutes the church? When he institutes the church, is he planning for decades? Is he planning for centuries? He's planning eternally, right? So this was something that was really kind of an eye-opener to me when I started doing family ministry. Um, this guy sort of that I used in one of my Bible studies really unpacked the promise given to Abraham, okay? Um, which is just further applied to a larger group of people when Jesus comes along. That through your offspring, the nation, all nations of the earth will be blessed. How is that going to happen? Now, in the context of this Bible study, is highlighting the multi-generated, generational aspect of family but it's the same with church right so think just imagine if we decided essentially to church for this generation we're not going to observe any of those sort of quaint traditions that are normally associated with formal religion okay where would that leave us do you think in two generations everybody's going to be doing their own thing right there would be no um, real <clears throat> observance of the commands of Christ, because all of those things are secondary to my personal experience of the divine. And, the way, and, and really the, the issue that, that, is a, that comes as a result of that, if you boil it all the way down to the bottom, is that I want to meet God on my own terms. And I'm sorry to tell you, that's not the way it works when you're meeting with God. Right? When you meet with God, you're meeting on his terms. And so one, at base level, we assume there's a reason why he instituted an earthly institution like the church and gave it specific instructions to follow. Right? Jesus is very, quite specific. Right? Yeah. When God said that to Abraham, wasn't offspring singular, meaning Jesus Christ? Yes. Yeah, okay. it was. Um, so the comment was made that uh, the promise given to Abraham, the offspring being referred to, wasn't just like Abraham's offspring in general, but specifically to Jesus. Um, which is really cool because that's a signifier as Christians that there was already a promised plan of salvation, not just for the chosen people of God, but for 
all nations, right? Which is, of course, fulfilled in Jesus. So when you come to church on Sunday, you're a part of, I mean, just think about this for a moment. I, I at least personally, I find this really cool. Like many of the things you're doing, the invocation, the reading of the creeds, you know, um, hearing God's word, the singing of certain praises. I mean, that's connecting you to Christian worshipers for millennia. I mean, think about that for a moment. Millennia. And we understand worship also as a meeting of heaven and earth. So I always find All Saints Sunday particularly powerful because it's our understanding that the things that we're singing praises to God about now are also the things we're going to be singing praises about to him in heaven. And so it's our understanding when we sing like the Sanctus and sing holy, 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 that it's not just earthly Christians who are singing that, but those that are in heaven as well. Right. And so this, the, the sort of institution that Jesus has through his disciples is meant to have this huge scope. And so in the context of my individual life, it may seem tedious at times, or it doesn't make total sense to me as to why I have to do this thing this way, or why does the pastor have to do this? And in certain emergency situations, the answer is, well, he doesn't have to, right? So why does the pastor, why is the pastor the one who baptizes your children? Why can't it just be you? or the dad, or the mom, or their brother? Well, the answer to that is technically it can be them, right? In the case of an emergency, we say anyone can baptize, right? Because it's not me that's creating the power of baptism, it's God's word, which you're just as capable as I am of saying that. I mean, I baptized a baby in a hospital out of a plastic bowl, right? Um, and his dad could have done that if it was in a situation where he wasn't sure I was going to make it there in time. So why is it that the pastor is given to do those things? He's given to do those things because of the, uh, this is sort of like a, a phrase that doesn't appeal to the people who wrestle with this, but for the sake of good order. So we understand our God as being a God of order, right? He brought order to the chaos of the universe in creation, right? And, and he laid down how certain things are going to work and how they're going to function. And he does the same with the church. Uh, but once again, it's meant to serve us, not the other way around. Right? Uh, so hopefully that, that helps with understanding. Because um, I, I, I was always frustrated when people would pit their own personal worship of God against the formal institutional worship of God, as if one was better than the other. They're both necessary, and they both rely on one another. Because there are unique things happening on Sunday morning. Uh, so don't forego that for your own sake. Okay, um, what is God's purpose for this commandment? So if we look at the, uh, the meaning here, we should fear love God so that we do not despise preaching in his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. So when we say, what is God's purpose for this commandment? Teach us to, to teach us fear and love God. Okay, teach us to fear and love God. Let me ask you this. How do you know anything about Jesus 2,000 years ago? The Bible. The Bible. All right, so what happens when you get together in worship? What do you hear? The Word, right? So Luther highlights that there. So he said, like, this is something that will naturally happen to you. If you've ever gone a period of your life, without going to church for an extended period, it doesn't even have to be that long, maybe it's just a matter of months, you do begin naturally to start despising God's word. Why do you think that is? Conviction, right? It's doing its work, right? It's, it's holding up a nasty mirror that's revealing all these things about yourself that you'd rather not hear. And then all of a sudden, Church is the last place you want to go because then you're going to have to face all of these things about yourself and others that you don't want to face, right? So the, the purpose of this commandment is to keep us connected to God's word on a regular basis. Because we all, I mean, and I'll be the first to admit this, we all, how many of you guys have some form of personal devotions? You do something, personal devotions. It doesn't have to be something super formal, but you do something, right? 
How many of you go sometimes where it's like for two weeks, it's like perfect. I mean, every day and at the same time, I didn't write, it's been great. And then for like the next three weeks, just blah. This totally doesn't work, right? Uh, and that is, that's a natural ebb and flow of that, right? Uh, but especially if you're doing it all on your own, it's hard to keep that consistency. And so one of the functions of the church gathering together and the worship service on Sunday is that even if your personal devotions were terrible this week, you went and you heard God's word. You were forgiven of your sins. You received the gift of his word and of his body and blood. And you were reminded that, yeah, Jesus knows. He knows that you're not perfect. That's why he came here. And that's why it's about him and not about you. And then it's like you leave church and you're so like, oh, okay, man. I really needed to hear that. Um, Question number two, what is the significance of the Sabbath for the church today? So open up to Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. If you have your catechisms, I believe it's actually written in there for you on page 77. Skip ahead a little bit here. I have it again. Yeah, go ahead and read it, Cheryl. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. All right. Let no one pass judgment on you in question of food and drink or with regard to festival or new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. All right. If we look underneath there, what do we still need even today? We still need physical rest. We still need that. We still need spiritual rest from the burden of sin, right? So Sabbath is a sign of pointing to Jesus. So one of the things when I was doing youth ministry that I would talk to high school seniors about is when you're looking for a church, when you go to, when you go to college, because believe it or not, almost no one has that conversation with them. We put in all of this effort in making sure that they know exactly what they want to do when they get to school, and we put no effort into helping them find a church home or a group of Christian friends at the, the school they're going to. One of the things that I would always point out is if there is no LCMS church in your town that you're going to, because sometimes there isn't, you have to find a church that's actually relieving you of the burden of your sins. Okay? Uh, and there's a distinction there that we make between, and I think we've talked about this in here, uh, the difference between explanation and proclamation. That if all that's ever being done for you about forgiveness is that it's being explained to you, that, oh, there is this guy, his name was Jesus, and he died on the cross 2,000 years ago so that people would be forgiven. What has not happened in that explanation of forgiveness? It's correct, but what hasn't happened? There's no action. There's no action? You. Are you. There's no you in that statement. So it's great that you're telling me about this objective thing that happened in history out there with God. But what does it have to do with me? And in proclamation of forgiveness, we say, you are forgiven of your sins. And it's stated by the command of Jesus Christ, I forgive you of all of your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right? And explanation of sin and forgiveness does not relieve the burden on the conscience of a sinner. The proclamation of that, that forgiveness is for you through the work of Christ is what we're saying. So I always, tell, I always told them that if, the, if you're going to a church that does not do that, find a new church. Because that builds up and builds up and builds up, and it will inevitably crush you. So you need to have one where the word is being applied to you in the context of forgiveness. Otherwise, you're not getting the spiritual Sabbath rest. You're, you might as well be going to Christianity 101 at the local college. All right, uh, number three, we still need regular engagement with God's word by which the Holy Spirit sanctifies. So that was kind of what we were talking about before, where you can't rely necessarily on your personal commitment to your own devotions to keep that consistent application of God's word in your life um, because it comes and goes. Which, by the way, as you guys rightly pointed out, that's one of the blessings of gathering as the body of Christ, right? I might come into church and be like just in a foul mood about myself because of that week. 
and I'm not going to be receiving the word of God the way that it's meant to be received. And then somebody says, oh, hey, it's so great to see you at your worship. How are you doing? And you get your conversation, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, yeah, that's right. I like being here. And I like being here because God's word reminds me not to have such negative and self-destructive thoughts. But that I know where those are coming from now. Um, number three, why is gathering for worship vital on page 78 in your catechism? So we talked about this a little bit already, but we'll touch on it real quick again here. Why is it vital for us to gather together with fellow Christians in public worship? The Word of God gathers all who believe in Jesus Christ into the Holy Christian Church. Okay, so when we say the Holy Christian Church with a capital C, we're referring to the invisible church, okay? Um, so we're not referring to the Lutheran Church or the Catholic Church or the Presbyterian Church. We're referring to the, the church of true believers, which we have no idea who's in that church other than just knowing that it's people of genuine faith, okay? <clears throat> and also calls believers to gather together in congregations for public worship for several reasons. A, God is present in his word, as his word is proclaimed and as his sacraments are administered. Through these means of grace, he freely gives his gifts and blessings, chiefly the forgiveness of sins. In worship, our shepherd Jesus speaks through the mouth of the shepherd, pastor, whom he has called to care for our souls. The word of God is not simply information, but the word actually delivers what it says. So we talked about that a little bit before that. It's auto, um, I'm trying to remember the word, but it's autogenetic. That it, it creates that which it describes. Right? So it's not just a description, but an active thing. Uh, B, we hear God's word at a set place and time. Though it is delivered through fallible men and sinful means, the word that is read, preached, and spoken over water, bread, and wine is not to be scorned. Sunday worship is a public testimony to our faith in Christ and his resurrection from the dead on the last day of the week. So at the end there, it talks about this being a public testimony to our faith. Right. Um, in our culture, for a long time, going to church and worshiping God, no big deal, right? Most people do it. It's something that is lauded and, and looked up to. Um, but what if you live in a culture where that's not the case? What greater testimony to the veracity of your faith that you gather together to worship, even if it's illegal and even if the penalty is severe? And many of our Christian brothers and sisters across the world do this. Right? And to be frank, we may be asked to do this in our lifetimes. Okay? Um, so like it's I wanted to point that out just because sometimes because it's become such a normal fabric of our lives here in the United States, we don't often think of coming to church as a testimony. And I try to do this like in the context of families, I try to help them see this as well. Um, it's usually a universally just seen as a negative thing of, oh well, a, a, you know an important sporting event got scheduled on Sunday. And what I try to do is help them realize that God's giving you such an excellent opportunity to bear witness to your faith. Because most of the time when you're when you're on your traveling baseball team, nobody probably even talks about or knows about you're a Christian. But if so-and-so missed a game, and so he said, where'd they go? Oh, so they weren't coming today because they're going to church. They're going to think about that. Right? Um, and the same with just coming to worship on Sunday. It's a, it's a public testimony of your faith. All right, letter C. Believers are still sinners who need one another and the encouragement received from one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. We share our blessings, burdens, and joys, and petitions and hymns of praise with those present, remembering the church throughout the world and the saints and angels of heaven. So that's basically, we, we kind of hit on all of those already, but I wanted to read the formal part here in the catechism. Any questions about any of that? So, um, let's see what I have next on here. Okay, what is valuable about liturgical worship? And I, and I put it for these there. Remember that liturgical is not a term of style. So when I say liturgical, I'm not saying what's valuable about the worship that your mom or your dad or your grandparents did in 1960. Okay. 
I'm asking you what's valuable about worship. Many of the things we described, the, the liturgy of worship is the, the structure and the drama of it. So what's valuable about the structure and drama of worship, the way it's organized? And why, why should any change to that be done carefully and considerately and looking to the scriptures before it's made? When the liturgy is based on the Bible, you know it's true. Yeah, so the point was made when the liturgy is based on the Bible, you know it's true, right? And that goes back to, I can't even remember the weeks we're blending together, but a couple weeks ago I preached a sermon on authority, right? And, and part of that is, is reflected in my office as well. Like all the things that I've said to you this morning, were they on the authority of Adam Thompson, the wisest human being that's ever lived, or were they on the authority of the scriptures? They are on the authority of the scriptures, right? I wouldn't be able to stand here and speak with such conviction if it was on my own authority. Um, so, if we look at uh, what the Catechism says there on page 79, what is valuable about liturgical worship? And they highlight the pattern, which we talked a little bit about already. Christ speaks his word and gives his supper. The church receives, receives and answers in confession, thanksgiving, and petition. Okay? And the funny thing is, if you go to the most contemporary Christian worship service, they may have downplayed some of those elements, and some of them have removed some of those elements, which is usually where I know I don't want to go to worship there. But those are the basics of the Christian faith, those things there. That Christ speaks his word and gives his supper. The church receives and answers in confession, thanksgiving, and petition. Okay. Um, so if you go to a church and there's no confession absolution, that's a problem. It doesn't matter exactly how it's being said, but there needs to be confession and absolution, right? Because when you come to worship, you're coming into the presence of the king. And it's like going home when you broke curfew, and you know that your parents know that you did it. Right? So it's the elephant in the room, which is why we do it at the beginning. Right? We know that he knows. So there's no point in hiding. Right? Um, so if you're if you're going to a church that doesn't have that, that's a problem, right? So when I do when I did interviews for churches going out of the seminary and, and when I did the call process here, I said, look, you know, I have a personal preference as an individual, but as a pastor, style doesn't really matter to me so so much as content. So what I'm getting at when I say that is, like, I don't so much care about the individual wording of the confession absolution as long as it's doing what it's supposed to do, which is I'm confessing my sin, and forgiveness through Christ is being proclaimed to me. Now, if you're going to want to change that constantly, you're going to have to give them a good reason to do that. But that in and of itself is the important thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, I think we're almost out of time. Well, maybe I'm a little bit over here. Yeah, I'm a little bit over. So next week, just to kind of whet your appetite, we're going to talk about what the third commandment means in the context of COVID. Because this has brought up a lot of questions about the third commandment. Because, well, I'm watching online, and, you know, is that any different than being in person? And I, on some level, I know it's different, but what exactly does that mean? And, and how, should I, how should I feel about that as a Christian? And, and, and what sort of risk assessment should I make? So we're going to talk about all that next week in the context of the third commandment. Um, I was hoping to get to that today, but... I talk a lot. I apologize. <laughs> okay. Uh, any any questions or anything about anything we discussed today before we wrap it up? Yeah, Ron. Uh, in, in Christ ascended to heaven before the apostles spread, spread my word. Mm -hmm. all, is he talking about the structure of this? Sure. That's a great question. So Ron asked a uh, that when Jesus ascended, he, he gave instructions to his disciples to go spread his word. And he asked, when he said that to them, is this what he was talking about? The sort of structure and the institution of what we now call the church. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah. It's a great question. Um, yes, I would say he, he is, right? Um, because, like, if you think about um, when you have a goal or you set a vision, you also have to create vehicles by which that is accomplished. Right? And so it's no accident that when Paul would go around to these Gentile cities and he would be 
taking the Great Commission with them, teaching them about Jesus, preaching Jesus, and Jesus crucified and the forgiveness of sins, that when he left, he didn't just leave, right? He left people there whom he had trained specifically, right? That's our understanding, that they, they knew more than others, and their job was then to do that in their area, right? Um, so that's one of the reasons I think why the Lutheran technique for evangelism has been less like big and flashy and more about we're going to move into this town and our number one priority isn't getting a thousand people together about Jesus. It's we're going to start a church and then through the ministry of that church, bring people to Jesus because it's in that context that we know that the gifts of Christ are being given. Now, that doesn't discount the informal, or maybe you could say spirit-led aspect of that, because one of the reasons the Holy Spirit makes a lot of Lutherans uncomfortable is precisely because he's not systematized or controlled. Okay? And that's an important element of God and the way the church works that we need to keep in mind. But it's a balance, right? It's a balance between the, can the spirit work outside of the bounds that the church has been given? Yes, he's God far be it for me to say he can or can't do something. But because of our limitations, right, our, our short memories, our willingness to rationalize our own problems away, all those other things that we talked about a little bit with regards to well, what if we're all just worshiping and doing our own thing, you know, then eventually there's not going to be much uniformity. And before long, nobody's even really remember the scriptures. So, so that's kind of, does that sort of answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And to uh, you know, back up the question a little bit, immediately after the Civil War, the LCMS was the first and pretty much the only church that went to the South to help the, the recently freed Blacks set up their own church yeah. and start yeah. things. That Pastor McCants in, uh, in Homewood is a, uh, what, maybe a third generation descendant of all that. So that's uh, pretty cool. And so the, the point that was made is that uh, the, the LCMS is one of the first churches after the Civil War to really uh, move in and work to uh, evangelize and help set up churches for the newly freed slaves. And actually, if you really, like, I think a lot of times now we're hypercritical of ourselves because we're not like the, the hip and growing denomination that everyone hopes we would be. Um, but if you look at our history, I mean, it's really... For a long time, second, pretty much only to the Catholic Church, we were a leader in overseas missions and the, the ways that the number of missionaries we would send and the ways that we would do that, um, which is actually a good example of, of your question, Ron, is what, a, what does a missionary do when they go to a new country? Right? They, don't, they don't go in and just preach God's word and move on to the next town and preach God's word and move on to the next town and preach God's word. That's maybe where they'll start, but they learn the language. They raise up leaders within the culture and native people, and they build churches. Right? Because human beings need that structure and that organization. And that's one of the reasons why the Christian church is set up that way. Right? It's a reflection of our needs. But at the same time, it can become overly rigid when the, the spirit-led aspect of things becomes ignored, which has happened in the church history from time to time. Okay, that's... Uh, that's it for today. Um, thanks for joining us online. Uh, we're going to close with a word of prayer, and I wish you God's earnest blessings on your week. And stay safe out there on the slick sidewalks and roads today. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your gifts, the gift of your word, which you so generously pour out for us so that we can know of things that affect us today that have happened so long ago. We thank you for the gift of your church where we can gather as the body of Christ where my insufficiencies and your insufficiencies are shored up by our brothers and sisters in Christ and that your grace can be given out through your word and through your sacraments. Um, we ask your blessing on us as we seek to fulfill the command to go out and make disciples and to share your word with others. Help us to do so with courage, and with joy so that others may come to know the joy that we have experienced ourselves even now of being a part of the body of Christ and receiving those gifts. I will ask your blessing upon this week, and um, all these things, Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.
Well, thanks, everybody. Have a blessed week. Thanks for joining online. Have a great week.